Now that you are familiar with recursive unions, you know how to define a data structure that can store an arbitrary amount of information. For example, here is a list of 30 posits that we just generated. Unfortunately, this list is a little hard to read and would be even harder to type. Every additional posit stored in the list introduces another level of nesting of parentheses because every time we use a constructor counts, we have to use another pair of parentheses. This creates this diagonal nesting pattern, which means that every additional posit gets indented by one more level. And also, all the closing parentheses at the end bunch up, making the entire list extra hard to read and type. This is actually just a matter of notation. Recursive unions are a great way to store and process an arbitrary amount of information, but it will be nice to have better notation for reading and typing them. That is the role of list abbreviations. List abbreviations can make lists easier to read and write, especially lists that occur in examples. To illustrate this, let's look at some lists of strings and see how these examples of lists of strings become easier to write first. Here we have five lists of strings made of counts and empty. To understand how counts and empty are used to make these lists of strings, it is useful to look at the signatures of counts and empty. Empty is the list of strings that every list of string begins with. And then when we want to add one more string to the list, we have to use counts. Every time we use counts, we are adding one more string to the list. So for example, if we want four strings in our list, then we have to use counts four times. And that's why there are four pairs of parentheses on this last line. When we run this program, we get the same result back, except the word empty is spelled in this other funny synonymous way, apostrophe, open paren, close paren. It turns out that in the beginning student language, there is another function built in. This function is called list. List is an interesting function because it takes any number of inputs. For example, if you give it four inputs, like here, four strings, it will give you back a list of strings. If you give it three strings, it will give you back a list of strings. You can give it any number of strings, and it will give you back a list of strings. You can even give it no string, and it will give you back a list of strings. So we can use the list function instead of empty and const to make these list of strings. We've just switched to using list to construct all these same examples. So we are actually producing the same list of strings. You can see this by hitting the run button and you get the same combination of counts and empty as before. All that's changed is how we write, how we notate these list of strings. So the list function is very handy if you know exactly how many inputs to give it. In other words, if you know exactly how many strings you want in your list of strings. It is not so useful if you have some unknown list of strings and you just want to add a couple more strings in front of it. And that is why the list function is best used inside examples and not so useful in definitions. If you find yourself using the list function in a definition, it is probably incorrect, although there are exceptions. Okay, that is how the list abbreviation helps us write example lists better. It turns out that 
list abbreviations can also help us make lists easier to read. These lists in the interactions window are currently not so easy to read. They are made of MTN counts. They have a lot of levels of nesting and they have closing parentheses bunched up at the end. Instead of these calls to counts and empty, we can tell Dr. Racket to produce calls to the list function in what it produces back to us. If you go to the beginning student language in the lower left corner and choose instead beginning student with list abbreviations, then when you hit run, Dr. Racket is going to use the list function in returning results back to us. And that makes the list more readable. Now remember, this is just a matter of notation. Inside the computer, every list is still constructed in the same way as before, using empty and counts, just like we defined in our data definition. List is just an abbreviation that we can use when we talk to the computer and the computer can be told by us to use when it talks back to us. You can always use the list function in examples you write in your program, but if you want the computer to use list in the results that it returns, then you have to switch the language from beginning student to beginning student with list abbreviations. When you switch on list abbreviations in the language menu, no matter whether you use empty or counts or list to express your lists, you are going to get list abbreviations back. Here I've switched back to using empty and counts to express my five list of strings, but because I have turned on list abbreviations, when I choose run, I get the results back using list abbreviations. Another way to understand how list abbreviations work besides these signatures is to think about some equations between lists that are expressed using empty and counts and lists that are expressed using list. When we write list, let's say A, B, C, D, whatever they are, that's just the same thing. That's just an abbreviation that is exactly equal to writing this nest of four uses of counts. When we write just A, B, C, that's equivalent to three uses of counts and so on and so forth. When you get confused about list abbreviations, the first thing you should do is to just stop using them. You never really need list abbreviations. You can always use empty and counts, which are far less confusing. You can also use these equations in both directions to calculate back and forth between lists expressed using abbreviations and without abbreviations. And that is how you could perhaps better approach the lecture exercises that follow this video.